My name is Betsy Lakin, and my community was women from Muslim majority societies. Um, before coming on this program, I worked for Women's Voices Now. It's an international, organi international nonprofit organization, and we amplified um, freedom of expression of women from Muslim majority societies through film, art, and through many other platforms. Therefore, coming to this community, I really wanted to then focus on women living in New York. And specifically, I was looking to focus on activists, artists, women working in media as journalists um, in this community and to see um, what their needs might be. Specifically, I was looking um, to see how this community is covered in New York um, <laughs> the best, and the best ways to cover this community as far as um, overcoming different perceptions, stereotypes that we often find in mainstream media. I was also looking to see challenges that, that women have who work as journalists in this community. Um, we went through a lot of that during community engagement and just seeing some of the challenges that they face while trying to um, have the trust of their community while also reporting sometimes negative stories on them. And I was also looking to see the intersection of, especially now, um, that we're seeing um, Islamophobia or anti-Muslim bigotry and how that relates and how it's intersected with genuine concerns about violent extremism and um, you know difficulties that we're seeing balancing this out and what is actually and how we would go about um, handling that in media. So I started off um, with just the community. Islam is the fastest growing religion in America as well as in the world. By um, after 2050, it will um, surpass Christianity as the largest religion in the world. And in New York, they're around 400,000 to 800,000, um, depending on some different surveys out there. It's around 3% of the population in New York. And so I started off um, with our metrics class, doing a survey of around 45 women from our community. And I was mainly looking at their habits in media, how it relates to other um, millennials and other um, communities as far as what platforms they use, how they get their news, um, you know, those kinds of questions. And I found that although we keep hearing that, you know, Facebook isn't as popular anymore, especially among the millennials in this community, Facebook was still used for news, for connecting with people, um, followed by Twitter. And um, as far as for devices, um, this kind of aligned with what we're seeing, that um, they mostly check their news on mobile devices, followed by laptops, and so on. I was also very interested in checking um, their opinions and their enthusiasm for kind of a more streamlined platform for um, an events calendar related to this community. I mean, I found in New York alone you have hundreds of nonprofits related to arts, related to human rights, related to, to women. A lot of them are divided by countries. You have an organization for Iranian women, for Afghan women, for um, Egyptian women, and for someone who was who was going to this was covering this community and going to all these different events, it was nearly impossible to to find out what was happening, and um, and that seemed to be the case for other women as well. Um, it was just it's really hard and it's really stagnated and there's just really a lot of um, although it's great to have these different sectors um, to combine them would really help a lot um, as far as empowerment and helping to chain aspects of the community. And a lot of women um, who took the survey and who I spoke to were really enthused about this idea. And so it's, um, it's in the works as a website, it's currently mostly on Facebook, that I just post events going on in this community, jobs, internships, um, meetups, fundraisers, and um, also, you know, academic studies. I've met with um, two different groups working on projects from the School of uh, Visual Arts, Journalism and Design program, and they were looking to interview women from this community for some of their projects, and so we were able to um, find them women to interview just by, by using this now growing network on Facebook. I was also um, interested in exploring how m Muslim women are portrayed in media. And I keep going back to this global, this study by Global Fund for Women because it really reiterates what um, many women who I spoke to said, where that you, you have um, the appearance overload, you have just endless focus on women in media. If they're wearing the veil, if they're not wearing the veil, are they wearing the hijab, are they wearing a, you know, what, what are they wearing, who are they wearing, um, becomes kind of this obsession of women. 
The other one is, um, is oppressed, is always the victim, um, doesn't have a voice, only their husband speaks for them, they don't work, they're at home, um, just kind of making them invisible in society. And the last way is just kind of creating this monolith that um, you know, all women, all Muslim women are the same, they dress the same, they speak the same language, they have the same culture, when in fact there are you know, over 40 countries that women come from, they speak many different languages, they observe um, their religion in many different ways. There are a lot of women who come from Muslim-majority countries who are not Muslim, they're Christian, they're Baha'i, there are other, um, there are many other religions. And so um, when I spoke to women in media, um, I came across a lot of different themes and a lot of different things that I learned as a takeaway as someone who, who plans to continue to cover this community and, and to make it a beat. Um, I learned so much from speaking to, to women journalists. Um, the first thing is to be sensitive to political, um, to potential conflicts when reporting on this community. I kind of saw it, it was kind of, it worked in both ways where I was told by some women that when they see an article or they see something created by women who, let's say, don't have a Muslim sounding name per se, they kind of scrutinize it a little more. They kind of want to know, okay, what's their background? What brought them to report this? What's your interest? You know, they're kind of looking for some validation there. But it also works on um, a theme that we spoke a lot about in community engagement is that there is hesitation from this community on reporting on their community, whether it comes from just not wanting to be the one to break that terrorism story to other internal conflicts such as someone Sunni, someone Shia, and they feel that you know, they are not the best person to handle that story. And they're not, you know, they would rather someone come in who's more objective and it would be better for, for their story and for, and for journalism. Um, I spoke to Reem Nasser, who is a CUNY graduate in 2014, works at CNBC, and, and that was exactly what she spoke about. And she was also very, um, you know, she acknowledged that her, her newsroom is older, it's mostly men, mostly white men, but she was very appreciative when they would at least come to her for explanations or for clarifications on things instead of just kind of going with the stereotypes or not really exploring, you know, issues. And that she thought it was always better to, she appreciated when people would come and ask it and, and admit, you know, that this could be a stereotype, I'm not really sure and you know, really valued her opinion at work. Um, next thing is the, the need for more platforms for a more, a more nuanced coverage of women in this um, society. So um, there's absolutely a need, and it's something that I'm trying to create, is um, a hyperlocal site for Muslim women. I, I spoke to women including Maria Ibrahimi, who before she retired from CNN, she was the highest ranking Muslim um, female executive in, in media. And she, um, she spoke about even in, even in Muslim media, it's, it's a lot of it's run by men. She'll go to events for the Muslim community and, and panel discussions are often all men. And again, this is obviously an issue that we have well beyond this community. But um, she, um, she did say about the need to create more, more platforms just for Muslim women and more about normalizing Muslim women. Um, she spoke about a lot of her friends who are freelance journalists and they try to pitch stories, but it's when it's not reactive to a certain issue or it's not a hot button issue of terrorism or extremism or um, female gender mutilation, you know, these negative things we see about this community, when it's not reactive to that and when it's just, let's say, an interesting story, um, they're much harder to pitch to mainstream media. And there is, there is a need to, to get these stories out. Um, the last thing is the awareness of alternative and independent media coming from these Muslim majority countries. A lot of women spoke about how, um, it, you know, they're they're very interested in how the U.S. reports the news um, from their countries. So, going on. Um, so, um, coming up in 2016, um, I finally plan on launching some of the multimedia projects I've been working on. This includes um, a podcast on artist series, um, specifically Iranian artists. Here is um, filmmaker and artist Man Razai. She's Baha'i and her father has been in prison in Iran for over seven years. And so I did a podcast on her speaking about growing up as a minority in Iran and as Baha'i and how um, she and her family were persecuted. I also spoke to a lot of Iranians about um, just how there's finally hope and excitement among in the art world because um, due to some agreements, though we don't really know what's, what's happening with Iran and if they're following anything, but the country has opened up a lot and 
um, Iranian artists finally feel that they're able to show their work and they're able to, to really get their, their stuff out there. And so we're seeing a lot of changes within the society. And the last thing is, um, this is a very rough cut, but it's um, a documentary that I'm creating about um, Syrians living in Brooklyn. We're talking a lot about, okay. It's uh, just like less than a minute. Living in Syria is uh, very, very, very beautiful. I have a very good childhood and I was a uh, hardworking girl. I studied in the street and I was a top in my, uh, in my college. We applied for asylum in August 2014. Until now, there is no response about our case. We can't go to Syria because uh, my last visit was uh, so bad. I'm afraid that if I go, maybe they arrest me. Yeah, no, she's out of D.C. and yeah. yeah.